Right. <laughs> Stay healthy. Don't freeze. <laughs> Yeah, I listened to a commentator, and one of his, his funny things he says is, number one rule is don't get dead. <laughs> Stay safe. <laughs> so that's how we can pray for him, for sure. Yeah. Don't get sick again. So, Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? There we go. Uh, let's pray quickly. Um, Lord, pre please bring the words to my mouth which you want me to speak. And let the words that leave my mouth find the perfect place in every ear and heart that hears. Let everyone hear only your spirit through this message. Amen. So I decided to sit. Um, I, I skied two days in a row, and, and the skiing is, uh, is helping. I ski with the school. The kids, we take the kids up once a week now. And uh, it's something special they get to do with us. And, and so I, I also went with my wife, and my hip is, is a little bit tender today. It's, it's not hurt. It's just it says, you did a lot in the last two days. So I'm going to sit now. It's not, not usually what I do. Um, it's going to be odd, I think. Here, maybe I'll try these rabbit ears. Well, that does help a little. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, so the context with that, that comment was, uh, I was watching this documentary on Monday night called Everything and Nothing. Uh, there's an English uh, a professor of, of physics from England uh, explaining gravity and dark matter and everything in between, right? The entire universe. Um, it, was, it was about an hour, so you know, I thought, okay, let's, let's figure, figure this out because earlier in the day, I'd read a story about fission. Some of you may have heard about the breakthrough in fission. And, and, and they, they slam these two atoms together, and the resulting explosion, basically, can power your house. Now, they said that it was about a gallon's worth of gasoline that went in, and about a gallon and a quarter worth of gasoline that came out. That's the simple explanation. Okay. That's the first time it's happened like that. That's why it was so exciting to everybody, and the world went crazy, and they're like, yeah, really? <laughs> so you got, you got a quarter gallon of gasoline. Good. That, that is good, don't get me wrong, in, in the interest of science, it's, it's good. Um, but my thought was, is, did anybody give God the glory to that? Not many, I'm sure. There, there are some scientists who are Christians, but the only thing I heard for the whole week on this was, oh, this is going to save the earth, and we can now get off of fossil fuels, and, and on and on and on. But nobody gave God the glory. And if you remember a couple of sermons ago, three, four sermons ago, I talked about how there are medical miracles. And how we just kind of nod our head, oh yeah, that's a modern, modern, modern miracle of medicine. But it is. Vision is a miracle. Fusion is a miracle. All of these things, driving a car is a miracle. And the love that we have in our hearts is also a miracle. I was struck by the thought that I'd gone in, in a span of less than 12 hours, like 9, 10 hours, examining ideas as vast as the entire universe, right? All the way down to the smallest particle of the universe in the space of 12 to 14 hours. And nobody thought to give God the glory. That's why I read up on fusion and watch that documentary. So that I could be awed, part of it was so I could get an explanation from my students, because <laughs> they don't understand anything, fission, fusion, any of it. So I was like, do I get a, I need a better explanation. But the other part, the reason why I watch those documentaries is to find the awe, because it's awesome, it's amazing. If you go out at, at night and you, and you look up at the stars and just let it fill your soul, just, just be in awe, think nothing, and just stare. Now, not today because we got the fog, but when God created all of this, it was to make us wonder. And it's even better to be in the presence of God. And that's why I started with that phrase. Because all of these modern miracles, all of these scientific you know, uh, breakthroughs, they're meant to make us seek the presence of God. That's where we pick up in Acts. 
this new covenant of God. The sharing of the Spirit so that we can have the power to follow Jesus' example. That was it. We can't follow the example of love on our own. 2,000 years of recorded history, however many thousands of years you want to believe of mankind's history on earth, we couldn't get it straight by ourselves. We needed Jesus to die in order to know and have the power to love. So what did God command Peter to do? Normally, I would go through my week and, and I would go examine the Greek and the Hebrew and see the connections between this and that, and, and then you would have 55 slides. <laughs> That's not what God did. Right after that, that, that documentary, God impressed me. It's like 10 o'clock at night, and I'm about ready to go to bed, and I'm like, really, God? I'm going to write this out tonight? And God said, yes, you're going to do it tonight. That was Monday night. <laughs> I, I get the whole week. I'm supposed to have the whole week to prepare no, you're going to write this tonight. And so about midnight, 1 o'clock, I finished up. And I, I refined it throughout the week, even up to like 30, 40 minutes ago. I was refining still. Peter was given commands. Peter was given instructions. And we need to see how those instructions led him to love and lead us into love also in this season. You took, you took, I, I have like season in here like 25 times. So <laughs> it is a season and it's also, it's also an act. And so, yeah. Uh, so Peter, you have to put yourself in Peter's shoes. Peter had 40 days of basically on again, off again interactions with Jesus. His death, his resurrection, visitation, ascension, and that whole space there kind of overwhelmed me as I was reading, just like the documentary did. It put me into a sense of awe. It must have, to Peter, been feeling like everything and nothing. Seeing the Andromeda galaxy through the Hubble telescope or the Webb telescope now, and then turning to a, an electron microscope where you can see atomic structures, right? All in the span of a few seconds. It must have been overwhelming to see him leave and say, do what I commanded you to do. Like, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> that's a lot. So what did those commandments look like? Open your Bibles or your phone app. I'm going to steal that from Pastor Joe, just like any good teacher. Uh, open your phone app or your Bibles. I can't say it quite with, open your phone app. There you go. A little, little deeper there. Uh, Acts chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 4, 7, 8, and 11 quickly. We're going to do like a, a little review here. Um, and because I learned about space and time, I'm going to do it quickly. See, at that. Um, in verse 4, Jesus commands them, don't leave Jerusalem. So again, put yourself in the mindset of a first century Jewish believer. A Jew at that time knew that that meant stay in the place of God's promises. Jesus is saying to Peter, don't go looking for me in random places. Don't go build a temple in my home city. That would be kind of a thing that, that a person would do. A follower of a rabbi, an important rabbi, would, would want to continue that, that thought, that, that school of thought. So don't go build that temple in my home city. Don't go start something somewhere where our enemies can't find us. Don't run away. Don't run from Jerusalem and find someplace safe. Go back to where they killed me, he told them. Think about that. Because where they killed him, where they killed Jesus, was also where they wanted to kill Peter. And he told them to wait there. Wait there for what? Wait there for, to kill me? <laughs> you know, that would be my initial thought. What am I going to wait there for? Why did God, why did Jesus tell Peter to go and wait in Jerusalem? Because that's where God's holy ground is located. That's where God's elect are located. I don't know if you know that, but that's what the Jewish people thought of themselves as. It called them that over and over again. You are the elect. 
And that's why Peter and Paul use that phrase in regards to Christians in the New Testament. We are now the elect. The Jewish people for thousands of years thought of themselves as the elect of God. Because they were. They were the only ones that thought of a singular God of the universe. So they were the elect. God wanted to start amongst his elect where he started every other movement in the Bible. He wanted to give them the first chance. So then in verse 4, Jesus tells them, wait for what the Father had promised. In other words, wait for this thing I told you about called the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter, being a learned Jew, understanding the scriptures, walking with Jesus, seeing the miracles, seeing the miracles that Jesus himself credited to the Father and the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't credit them to himself. Peter had a full understanding of what that did and didn't look like. This idea of the Holy Spirit was well known to him from the Old Testament. He knew it wouldn't be a physical work of his hands. He wouldn't be out there putting together a church. He wouldn't be out there, you know, when I built my house, I called it putting up the sticks, you know. That's not what he was doing. He wasn't putting on a roof. It also wouldn't be a repeat of the Old Testament laws. Because Jesus has said over and over again, this is a new thing I'm doing. It wouldn't be theoretical ideas. It wouldn't be a a political cause. It wouldn't be a physical kingdom. It would be a continuation of the grace and love that Jesus had been preaching. Love and devotion for your neighbor and love and devotion to the righteousness of God. It would be like Abraham stepping out in faith with Isaac. It would be like Moses walking up to the edge of the waters with the army behind him. I don't know, God. You said, put down this stick. Part, please. (laughs) It'd be like David, little David, going out through that valley. And he could see him from a long ways away. He could see that, that whatever you want to call him, some people say six, some people say nine foot man down there. And yet he took one step after another and approached. He didn't run away. He approached because God gave him That word I told you about a few weeks ago, unction. God gave him the presence to do it through his Holy Spirit. That's what Peter knew of the Holy Spirit. In verse 7, he further commands, don't worry about times or epochs, epics. In other words, don't concern yourself with the things you can't control or are too big for you. Now, in the last year, I've learned quite a few things that I thought my mind was too small for, it was too big for me. For instance... How can free will and predestination live together, (laughs) right? You remember that one? That that was mind-blowing to me, that they can coexist somehow. I still don't get it all. I don't know how it all works. And then what in the world, if you were in a Revelation Bible study, what in the world are all those signs and bowls and judgments in the book of Revelation? I don't know. (laughs) I still don't know what all of them mean. And then, the most important, How am I supposed to love my neighbor? I kind of know, but there's other things I don't know about that. I'm still learning. I do know one thing. It's going to be very difficult loving your neighbor. It's not easy. And so that's why in verse 8 he follows up with the command they need the most. Receive the power. Don't run away from it. Don't be afraid of it. Don't... don't, uh, uh, So don't be afraid of it, but embrace it. It's going to take the power of the Holy Spirit to love your neighbor. Uh, Jay, you you were a teacher for 18, right, 18 years. I've been there for about 25 now, and trust me, those kids are vicious. (laughs) It's, It's tough. It's not easy. You want to take your pound of flesh. You do. And it's only through the power of God. It's only through the love of God. It's only through that connection with the Holy Spirit that I don't. It's only because somebody else loved me first. I saw the example of someone else's love, loving me. That's how I can love those kids, as if they're my own kids. When I seek his face, when it's too difficult for me to understand, his power is available. Verse 8, Jesus restates the Great Commission. Just in case they'd forgotten, be my witnesses. I've never considered 
<laughs> myself to be anything great. Don't get me wrong, I don't lack for self-confidence. It's probably one of my greatest downfalls, jumping into things over my head. But I constantly have been reminding myself for 33 years, remember what God called you to. Don't get distracted. No matter how many times other people have asked me, why don't you go write a book? Why don't you invest money for a living? <clears throat> Excuse me. Why don't you start a Christian school ministry? And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But it's not right for me. God has always reminded me, my witness is in the public school to those children. That's my job. That's my ministry. My mission field. From the time I was 19 years old, and I had that picture, and I asked God, please, just like kindergarten. <laughs> Seriously, that's, that's what came out of my mouth as soon as I saw that picture of a classroom. Just not kindergarten. And he, he honored that. But that's where I'm supposed to be. And if I get distracted down these other venues, I'm not going to be the best witness I can be there. I'm not going to waver until he draws a clear path to something else. Again, in verse 8, he specifies his final command, be prepared to go to the Jews, the Samaritans, and to all of the Gentiles. Now, as a follower of Christ, I'm sure Peter, again, was very hesitant to go back where they killed Jesus, where they killed the Messiah, and where they wanted to kill him. Also, Samaritans and Gentiles were not the elect. They were outside of the elect. Any Jew in first century Judea would say, no, God, they don't deserve it. They don't get the Holy Spirit, anything but that. That's reserved for somebody special like a Jew. But God sent him there nonetheless. Putting yourself in the mindset of a Jew 2,000 years ago, following a specific rabbi meant something. You became associated with every teaching. And if some of those teachings didn't live up to the examination of the leaders of the time, of the thought of the time, then that school of thought was put to the side. Sometimes it was called heretical and shunned altogether especially in the case of a leader like Jesus, who challenged the leaders of the time and the thought of the time constantly. The norm of the accepted teachings and practices was not what Jesus taught. Jesus taught to love your neighbor despite the rules, despite the laws. And all of these teachings were on the shoulders of Peter and the 11 others. Think about that. A bit overwhelming if you think about it. Like looking at the Andromeda galaxy. Finally, in verse 11, two men in white ask, why do you stand here staring? Now we get to where the rubber meets the road. Two men, appearing out of nowhere, ask a mundane yet profound question. Why are you just standing there? <laughs> get to work! <laughs> Stop staring up at the sky! Or some of us just standing there staring. Yeah, it's awesome to look at the wonders of God. But there's also work that must be done. So last week, Pastor Joe talked about the last days of Jesus. And it's perfect we have this message this week talking about the start of the church. See, because without that, without the end of Jesus' ministry, we couldn't have the beginning of the church ministry. And the church ministry is a ministry of love that has to be propagated, it has to come down, it has to be filling our lives. We've got to hear that message of love. Because rules don't fill you up. Rules can't fill you up. So while listening to Pastor Joe last week and rereading Acts chapter 1 and 2 together, God impressed upon me I should focus on Peter's decisions of what to do and what not to do in Acts chapter 2. Because it's very applicable. In this season, especially regarding our decision to represent Christ to our neighbors, our family, our co-workers, and then also in this season where we have a coming transition in both, we need reminders of how to love, how to be filled with the Spirit, because without the Spirit, we can't love fully. So Peter had three very bad choices in front of him after Jesus left. 
First, he could have decided to question his entire experience with Jesus and walked away or fallen into focusing on theology. It was all overwhelming. Okay, maybe walking away isn't too realistic, but don't some of us have doubts when we're overwhelmed? And that is when we begin to wander away. Judas Iscariot certainly did. Was all of that real? Did I really see a dead man rise from a grave? A dead girl get up out of a bed? The lame walk? Blind people seeing? Don't you think Peter also had some of those doubts about himself being the leader? It says he denied Jesus three times, so he certainly must have had some doubts. Just as it occurred to me, I had doubts after Pastor Bill retired. I thought, I can't do this. Maybe I should leave it to other people. Steve, he's been speaking up here. Steve, come on up. Jay, Jay's been, Jay's been leading worship. He can do it. Why do I need to do this, Lord? That said, no. I have a purpose for you to get up. Speak my Holy Spirit to this church. And so this is where I am. Or he could have left the promises and just studied the law, the rules, the most important proverbs, the 24 steps to wholeness, the 10 rules of holiness, the seven magic thoughts to revolutionizing your mind. Kind of sounds like an Amazon book list, right? Peter almost slipped into that error before Paul, a little later in the book of Acts, had to come in and remind him, look, it's not about the law, not about the rules. It's not about just putting in your time and making sure everybody is towing the line. And I can also confess that. It's been tempting since Bill left for me to just stick it out to how he did things. Nothing more, nothing less. Just keep us in maintenance mode. Don't push people. Give, give a, a message of, oh, let's all feel good about ourselves. But that's not what God wanted. Peter could have decided to try to steal away the followers of the Jewish leaders, thinking, I'm supposed to be the rock of this new church. They took my rabbi, I'll start my own temple and make it way better so nobody even wants to go to theirs anymore. I'll show them we're going to have the best worship team, the best Bible studies, the best sound and internet streaming system in 180, right? <laughs> uh, we're going to have the best preaching, the best miracles. They don't even know what they've started. I'm going to get my revenge on them. I'll create a church like Jesus told me to. Could have made that his focus. Dreaming bigger than what God dreamed. Having a vision bigger than what God's vision was. And that's also been tempting for me since Bill left. To go beyond. Try to make things bigger and better, constantly pushing. But that's not what God wanted. That's not the way God wanted me to lead. Peter did none of those things. Let's read from Acts 2, 1 through 13, what Peter did choose to do, what he purposed in his heart, what he committed himself to. So, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise, like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. So two choices were there, right? You see, they were together in one place. He stayed. He did what he was told. And then when the rush came in, he didn't run away from it. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together. And were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. So at some point it must have occurred to them, hey, this is what God told us to do and we're supposed to go share it out in the street. Because they were in an upper room, remember. They came down out of the upper room with this when people started gathering around outside. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, why are not all these who are speaking Galileans, Hicks from the sticks, and how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygian, Pamphylia, Egypt, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? 
But others were mocking and saying, they are full of sweet wine. That must be part of why I'm doing this, because I don't know if somebody not an English or a social studies teacher could say all those names. <laughs> so Peter <laughs> and the 11 others went back to Jerusalem and they prayed, right? They prayed and stayed, like they were told, in a room devoted to prayer, in unity, and searching the scriptures for references about Jesus. I don't know if you remember me talking about the upper room uh, several weeks ago, but that was a special place for rabbis and their followers. So something had to have really moved them to go down into the street, not to keep it to themselves. They searched day after 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 day, maybe after a tenth day too. Pray and search, eat. Pray and search, eat. Pray and search, eat. Pray and search, sleep. Same thing next day. Wash, rinse, repeat. It's between nine and ten days, depending on which version of the story you read. They were in that upper room. I was, I was playing a, a, a video game in my, my classroom. It was educational. It's about history. They learn about history. And, uh, and one of the other teachers came in, and the doors had been closed. It was with the, we have a boys' group and a girls' group. It was with the boys' group. And she came in the door to give me a note from, from the girls to fix something on the computer. And, and, uh, and she said, woo! I said, what? She says, it smells like boy in here. <laughs> uh, since COVID, I can't smell. I can't smell it. <laughs> so I don't even know. <laughs> um, but imagine... 10 days of that, 12 men plus a few plus ones in that room, praying constantly, eating, sleeping, drinking the fellowship. It's pretty amazing to me that they could do it that long. How many of us pray for more than a week for our need? How many of us pray for more than a couple of days for a specific need? More than 24 hours. More than just, I prayed this morning, God, why aren't you answering me? Another thought to reflect on. So, then what happens? After this nine to ten days, the Holy Spirit moves in a way the world had never seen. Never seen it before. The Holy Spirit had come down before, but not like this. People who shouldn't be able to speak the language of a culture thousands of miles away, basically calling them hicks from the sticks again, they suddenly speak fluently in a foreign language. It would be like one of us who's never studied another language or maybe a, a Latin-based language, suddenly being able to speak Swahili. Or maybe somebody from an Arabic country speaking Arabic all their lives, never studying another, even English never studying another language at all, and suddenly being able to speak Washu or Lakota or Navajo, some of the most remote languages on the planet. And all of this in the blink of an eye. Now, what are they saying? What do you think they're saying? They're speaking the message of Jesus, the message of love. Jesus, the most perfect exemplar of love that the universe has ever known, came and died for you and I, and if only you will turn to him, you too can be saved. That's the message. God sent his only son to lay down his life and save us from the sin, of penalty of, sin and the penalty of death so that we could live with him in a similar love relationship forever. And also the laying down of our lives for others because he first loved us. Just like I said, how I can love and forgive only because he first loved me. I can't do it on my own. Now, I don't know for certain the exact words on that day, what went into the ears of those people as they were hearing these sound waves come at them. I do know it's not far from the message I give to my students every chance I get. And I know it was probably very similar to the same one I heard at the age of 18. My 18-year-old ears received those sound waves the same way that those Parthians and Medes and, and Elamites and all the names that were in the 
Phrygians, etc. You see, I was just like those Parthians and Medes and Elamites. No one spoke my language. I didn't think anybody could, could relate to the abuses that I felt had been done to me. I felt I had suffered in a way no one else could understand. Nobody understood how deep and dark my life had been. Nobody spoke my language. So in Turlock, California, while I'm sitting there in 1989, and I'm looking around, thinking about how I'm going to apologize to my roommate. I've been really awful to him. Those remember the story. And I, I, was, I was mainly just thinking of the words I was going to say and then looking for him. I didn't even know there was a thing called a worship set. You know? <laughs> Three songs, announcements, another song, prayer. You know? I was clueless. I was just looking around for Eli. How am I going to, what am I going to say to him, right? Then Kurt Harlow gets up, starts the night off. And thinking about what exactly I would apologize for, I don't remember what the skit was about. There was a skit, it was basically 100 college students laughing at four college students up front. Um, thinking he's not much older than I am, he starts talking about dads. And boom, he had my attention immediately. Because just that day I'd been thinking about how terrible my stepdads had been. I'd been thinking about how my father, my dad, had abandoned me. I saw him maybe seven months from the time he divorced my mom when I was three, four years old. A month here, a month there, summer vacations. And here this man is that doesn't know me talking about the exact thing I'd been thinking about that day. How did he know? <laughs> he had my attention. Then I'm sucked in because all of this guy's stories, he's telling stories about growing up. He was in western Washington, or eastern Washington, sorry, which is a lot like Montana. And, and so the dumb stuff I did, he kind of did too. So I was like, wow, he's kind of, kind of my guy. He's speaking my language a little bit. And then there's things he's saying about how I thought life should be. And those begin ringing in my ears. He's, he's hitting everything I'm thinking. I'm like, how does this guy read my mind? Then he said something that pushed into the pain of how I was abused and shamed by my stepdad. And then he said something else about how I felt abandoned by my dad. And then something else about abuse by my stepbrother. And then the kicker, how I'd felt for years that the Heavenly Father had left me. I felt God had walked away from me, abandoned me just like my heavenly father, or my earthly father. The Heavenly Father must be the same. Then he, he had something that very true, a truth to this day. He said, the truth is that you have actually walked away from the Heavenly Father. And rushing back into me was that memory of me throwing that cross and saying, there can't be a God. There is no God. He doesn't exist. He doesn't answer prayer. Why would a God, supposed to be full of love, do that? Do all these things to me. And when that memory rushed back, I knew it was true that I had walked away from him. And then he said, and I say to you guys, that heavenly father is standing right here, right now, waiting for you to come and join him in relationship. perfect father who's been right there all your life, soothing and helping you as much as he could, as much as you would let him. And he's just waiting for you to turn back to him. I still get misty-eyed today. The floodgates opened. I began sobbing. Even before the end of the message, uh, I remember someone from behind me or beside me asking if I'd like to pray, and all I could say was, God, I'm so sorry. Over and over. I think I cried for two hours that night. Looking back to Acts 2 and verses 14 through 35, Peter got up and without a PowerPoint, without a, an arranged message, beginning, middle, end, he just preached a message about God's love, about God loving us despite our faults. He started a revival that lasted 2,000 years. There's a lot of details, Old Testament references. You know, I could go through the Greek for two weeks on you. 
Uh, I'm not going to do that. We're going to leave that for another time. Let's skip down in closing to the most important part of the message, verses 36 through 42. Peter finishes with this in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, just like I was, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That indwelling, remember before, it wasn't something that stayed with the people of Israel. It came and went. But now we get the gift. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Couldn't we say that today too? So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Here we hear the message of love delivered to a great crowd. And I want you to focus in on that last verse. This is the most important part. They devoted themselves to the teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. See, you may not know this, but Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Sorry, Aristotle. I always have to say it that way to remember. Aristotle wrote about a three-legged stool. Here we have four legs of the stool. You, know, you can sit on a three-legged stool, but even four is even better. Teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. That's how we are to love others. When people come to your house, when people come to your desk at work, when people come behind you in line and invade your space, how are you going to fashion a message without a PowerPoint, without a beginning, middle, and end, specifically for that person from the Holy Spirit? Just like Jesus comes across the woman at the well. Behold, I know you've had seven husbands, and the man you're currently living with is not your husband. How did he know that? God wants to use us in that way. How many times have us, as believers, had that experience? Something just so happened. It just so happened. Oh, I needed a car, and somebody gave me a car. I needed $500, and somebody gave me $500. When you need, the Father knows, and especially if you're trying to help share the message of love. God will fulfill that need. So we're entering a season, that word again, in which we have the opportunity to minister to lots of people about the reason for the season. Don't let it become a cliche. And that's for me too. I've already begun praying about the issues, and I wrote this on Monday, so it was actually a week before. So I've been praying for weeks now, as I learned who was going to be coming to our house for Christmas. And it wasn't so that I could win some argument. It wasn't so that I could position myself in some way and, and, and not have the conflict. No, the thing I'm praying about, the conflict in me. I have conflict inside myself. How am I going to lay down my flesh? How am I going to lay down? I want, when I really want to say that thing that I really don't want to say. You know what I'm talking about. Like, oh yeah, you want to talk about politics. Well, I got you. <laughs> I bring the receipts. I got the information. No, don't go there. No, it doesn't mean that you don't speak if the Spirit gives you utterance about politics. It doesn't mean any topic is off limit. Actually, Every topic is on limit, right? Unlimited. Because God will lead you in that conversation. Every time. The conflicts aren't between people, but between my flesh and my spirit as I laid down my life. Again, 
I can only love because Christ first loved me. How can I be a more loving father, husband, brother, son-in-law, Christ's servant in this church? The ways that I might serve and go the extra mile in forgiveness and grace and mercy. That's what God wants to get through us. Not the rules. The rules are easy. It's the spirit of the law. It's difficult. As he said in verse 4, this is the most important thing to me. I want to spirit speak as the Spirit gives utterance. This church, in time of transition, we need the same amongst each other. Are we giving of our time and our energy? Are we giving of our resources? Are we praying with others? Are we helping others to be sharpened by the Spirit? Are we truly in fellowship? Not a fake Christianese response to, oh, how are you? And, oh, I'm fine. How can we speak truth to each other but season it with grace and mercy. I was, I was awed by the fact that, that I had a conversation with someone in this church. It, it, it was a tough conversation. And it was an amazing conversation. And it brought healing. And then just this morning, I heard from someone else that said, I had an amazing conversation with someone else in this church. And it was healing and I was able to speak the truth with love and mercy and forgiveness. That's the Spirit of Christ. That's walking in the Holy Spirit. Being a witness to His love in our relationships with each other. Bringing other people closer to Him because we are accurately reflecting the love He showed us. As the worship team comes up, Please bow your heads and pray with me. There may be some of you here who felt a pang, a tug on your heart when you heard the words, I knew it was true that I had walked away. You might be feeling like you've walked away from God or gotten a little bit off the path or that you just aren't sure he's in charge of your life the way he should be. If that's you, know that he is just waiting for you to say, God, please help me. Pray with me this prayer. God, I know that I haven't been following as I should have, that I need the sacrifice of Jesus, that I can't do it in my own power. Please help me to follow you. I renounce those things that drag me away, and I turn back to you. Help me to love you more and serve you alone. You may be saying, Russ, that part about the pain I feel, the hurts and the wounds in my life that are stinging still to this day, how can I get rid of that pain? Pray with me. God, I know you are the perfect Father who heals physically, but more important, you want to heal me spiritually. Heal my wounded heart. Heal the pain from what's happened. Help me to leave that pain with you. Leave everything behind and focus only on the love you have for me. Help me to share the love and forgiveness I find in you with others. I turn to you because no one else knows. No one else has the power but you. Finally, church, pray with me for the church. Father, we have great things ahead of us, mighty works of love and fellowship. Help us work together in unity and in the mind of Christ. Help us hear your Holy Spirit clearly guiding us through these coming months of transformation and change. Show us how we may devote ourselves to the works of both our hearts and our hands as we lift up this church body as an offering to you. Go with us now and lead us this week in your Holy Spirit and in the love of Christ. Amen. In your folders there on the back side of the notes,